everybody. I'm Rachel O'Mara. I'm based here in San Francisco. I'm really excited to be hosting our speaker today, Carter Cass. A uh, little bit about Carter. He's here to talk about his book, The Right and Wrong Stuff. And Carter just came in from Chicago. Uh, he is a professor at Northwestern University in the Kellogg School of Management. He is a active teacher in the entrepreneurship and business school courses there, which is great. He's also an established uh, business veteran and a venture capitalist. So uh, Carter started his career at PepsiCo and derailed. So we're going to hear more about that, I think, today. I love that word, derailed. And landed on his feet, obviously. He also uh, was the chief marketing officer, founder of uh, Blue Nile. So if you actually remember that company from the days of uh, the heyday, uh, I do, then he was one of those integral people from there and worked with DoubleClick as they were uh, active with Blue Nile and also worked as the ex-CEO, well, at the CEO of Walmart.com. So a lot of experience. We're super excited to hear about what he's going to share today about careers and derailing and getting back on track. So please welcome Carter Cast. Thank you. Thank you. So the, one of the questions I get is, why would you write a book about failure? Uh, so let me tell you, the, what piqued my interest in this topic was I had a, uh, I lost touch with an old boss and he was super fancy, you know, the right schools and super smart. And I lost touch with him, and about 10 years after uh, the last time we'd met, I called him up, and I asked him, you know, how's, how's your wife, how's your kids? And then I said, how's your career? You know, what are you doing? And there was this disappointment in his voice when he talked about his career. And he hadn't reached the expected level of achievement that I thought he would and that uh, probably other people thought too. So we hung up the phone, and I literally wrote on a sticky note, what impedes the progress of talented people? And I stuck it on my wall at Northwestern. And then I decided it was such a, it, it's sort of a provocative question for me that I, I asked the dean of the business school if I could take a quarter off from teaching and just research and see, are there certain behavioral traits or skill gaps, certain themes that account for people that are good not achieving their expected level of development? And so, what I found is there are, and then I flipped the topic on its head, and I looked at what do high performers that don't derail, what do they've got? What's the right stuff? And so the, one of the major ways I did this, but I, I interviewed 100 people that got fired or demoted. I talked to a lot of coaches, HR, VPs, executive recruiters, CEOs, but I also mined 360 uh, research databases. So I looked at three, like thousands and thousands of 360s and teased out the difference between people in the top 10%, you know, like people that were in the top 10% in managerial effectiveness. What was their competency profile set versus people that were rated in the top and the bottom quartile? And I found that there's these very specific competencies they have. What's kind of cool is it's not like they're good at everything. There's only a couple things that these people are good at, but they're good at these things consistently, consistently, and I'll get into those, okay? So what I thought we'd do here is I will go on and talk for about 30 minutes, and I'm going to go over these five reasons I found that people run into trouble, and then we'll take a break and, and, and have questions, and then I'll, for about for the last 10 or 15 minutes, I'll talk about the wrong, uh, the right stuff, what people that do well what these competencies are, okay? So we're gonna look at both sides of the question. We're gonna look at why do talented people derail, but also what do high performers do very specifically that's different? So first of all, this is not a niche topic. Half to two thirds of us will have a derailment event. Either we'll get demoted or fired, I did. So I'll, I'll talk about that very honestly. Um, let me talk about definitions. When I talk about derailment, I'm talking about people who didn't reach the expected level of achievement by the HR department or by their boss. So they're not people, by the way, this is not a personal derailment. I did not look in this data set at people that derailed because they loved living in Boulder and they wanted to stay in Boulder, so they didn't take a move. 
or they are triathletes and they wanted to work out and they only wanted to work 20 hours a week or they had to take care of their kids and they worked three days a week. If they, if they made personal decisions that accounted for a quote unquote derailment, that was their decision. I'm looking here at people that wanted the brass ring and were working their tail off and didn't get it. What happens, okay? The second caveat to this is, I found in looking at all this research for three years that organizations are complicit. They move people too quickly. They uh, ignore bad behavior if the person's hitting their numbers. And they don't require superiors to develop subordinates like they used to. You know, you could say maybe part of that's the, you know, gig economy. But, you know, the problem is, as a result, employees, us, we aren't getting the feedback we need in most organizations. So I think it's wonderful that you do events like this so you can get, you can hear from a wide variety of people. So here are the five reasons I found over and over and over in the research. To make this more palatable and a little less sort of like jarring, like you, you know, instead of saying, oh, I suffer from interpersonal, you know, issues, you could say, oh, I have a little bit of Captain Fantastic in me. So I created these archetypes to make the topic less, you know, kind of less difficult. So here's the first reason. This is Captain Fantastic. This is the fellow who bruises you on his quest for the holy grail of the corner office. He's ego driven. He's dismissive. He's got poor listening skills. I, me, mine is his mantra. And we've all experienced him. And he usually does well because he's a self promoter but then he hits a wall at a certain point because he gets in a complex assignment where he needs the enlistment of other people and they don't want to work with him. And eventually you'll see that he was moved to special projects and then from there six weeks later he's no longer in the building. We know this guy. So he has relational issues, overly ambitious, driven by ego. Now let's say you're not this person. There's another aspect of this interpersonal issues I want, want you to, maybe you should pay attention to. So this woman named Karen Horney was a uh, clinical psychiatrist in the 40s and 50s, and she did a lot of work with people that have everyday neuroses. She found that we have three tendencies under pressure. We do three things that self-sabotage. She said we either move away from people when times are difficult, we, um, we distance ourselves, we're skeptics, we're cautious. We move against people, we're combative. Or we move towards people by being ingratiating. So that's Karen Horney. So Robert and Joyce Hogan took her work and developed the Hogan Development System, which is a very powerful tool that looks at a whole variety of things from goals to potential to derailment propensities. And they took her work and they found these 11 specific behavioral traits that happen to all of us. Under pressure, we do one of 11 things. We will, you see that first block, excitable, skeptic, cautious? That is the moving away from that Karen Horn I found. Then that next block is the moving against by being mischievous or arrogant or melodramatic. And then the last block is moving towards by being ingratiating. All of us do at least one of these things. I've taken this test. I had two. My sister's taken it. She had a couple. We created this um, Zell Fellows, um, Sam Zell. We created a program at, at Kellogg and we take high potential entrepreneurs and we put them in this boot camp program called Zell Scholars. And we make all of the Zell scholars take this. And all of them have some of these tendencies because, you know, we're human. We're going to have some. The question is, do you understand your own so that they don't hurt you? So there is a recent Harvard Business Review article two weeks ago. Um, Urich, E-U-R-I-C-H. She did this meta-analysis on self-awareness. You ought to get it. It's a great article. And, and she said there's two types of self-awareness. Internal self-awareness, do we understand ourselves? Do we understand our motives and our weaknesses and our strengths, our vulnerabilities? And there's external self-awareness. Do we understand how we're viewed by other people? And she said that, that 10 to 15% of us have self-awareness. 10 to 15% of us. 
85 to 90 percent of us lack self-awareness. So the Hogan is a great way to understand where you might have some of these interpersonal areas that are holding you back. Here's a guy, right about this time, this guy derailed. This is me, right about 29 or 30, and I was called into my boss's office during my annual performance review. He told me I was insubordinate. I was at Frito-Lay, I was a senior marketing manager. He said, you're insubordinate, you don't take my direction well, you're recalcitrant, I had to look that up, I wasn't quite sure what that meant, and I want you off my team. And I said, Mike, I'll call him Mike, because that was his name, Mike. Mike, are you firing me? And he said, not technically, but good luck finding somebody who wants you in their group. And so I took two weeks off, and I talked to my dad. I said, Dad, what do I do? You know, can you believe this guy? And he said, well, your mother and I are amazed you've made it seven years in a corporation. So he wasn't much help. So I decided to go back to Frito-Lay because I didn't want to end on that kind of a note. And I came back and found that I had this reputation for being difficult to manage. And I finally found this guy that would take me in his group. He's a Canadian. He just moved from Canada. So he didn't know my reputation. <laughs> and he took me in, and he helped me. But what happened was I took this Hogan, and I had these two traits that if I would have known about and would have been able to manage more effectively, I probably wouldn't have run into this trouble with my boss. This trait of leisurely is... It's a weird word, leisurely. It's basically when the heavy hand of authority pushes on you, you tend to sort of blow, the, blow it off. You know, I may or I may not follow the direction that my boss is suggesting. And mischievous in my case, which is, you know, let's throw a grenade in this meeting just to liven it up, you know? And so these traits I had served me poorly with a, uh, a bureaucratic system and a heavy-handed boss, and I derailed. And, and my, my point in sharing the story with you is, if I would have understood this about myself, I think I could have reined this in. Once I understood this about myself, that trait, those traits, I, I still have them. I still have the tendency, but they don't come out to play as much because I'm aware of them, and I'm aware of certain situations that stoke them. So, that is the first one, Captain Fantastic. Even if you aren't that cat, that's, that's arrogant and ego-driven, you still probably have one of those 11 Hogan traits that you've got to watch out for. So um, there's a good book called Why CEOs Fail by Dotlich and Caro, C-A-I-R-O, and in that they take the 11 Hogan traits and they list specific questions you can ask yourself to see if you have any of them, and you will. So it's the devil you know here. Second reason people fail. That first one, by the way, is more in men, and it's often as you get to be higher and higher level, you stop listening to people because you think you have the answers, and you start, thinking, um, you start thinking that you know it, and you don't seek feedback from the front line who always have the answers because they're closest to the customer. The second one is the solo flyer. This happens usually pretty early in careers. What happens is you get a strong individual contributor, they get promoted, and they still try to do all the work themselves. So they micromanage. They usually um, fail to develop their team. They, ta they, they hand out tasks, but they don't develop the people. Lominger Limited is a company that does talent management, Lominger. They were just bought by Corn Ferry recently. Lominger looks at 67 managerial competencies. It's a lot. You know, most companies look at about 10. They have 10. I don't know how many Google has. But 67th of 67 in terms of managerial effectiveness, developing others. It's the lowest rated trait by managers. So the chances are pretty good that you, know, you aren't going to get you aren't going to be developed well, and so you have to do it yourself. The other thing that was interesting in looking at this, because you get the micromanaging, you have to learn to let go. Actually, Linda Hill, this professor at Harvard, said getting promoted into management from being an individual contributor is literally a transformation of identity. We have to learn from, to go from doing to enabling. And it's hard when you're good at doing, it's hard to let go of the doing. 
So this third one, though, was interesting to me. Linda Hill also found, she wrote this book called Becoming a Manager. She followed 20 managers around who just got promoted, and she saw, like ethnographic research, she kind of followed them around, took notes like Jane Goodall did in Gorillas in the Mist, you know, watching. And she said that one of the things managers did poorly was they didn't realize that it's one thing for me to manage you, and it's one thing for me, another thing for me to manage our, this team here. But at least half my time as a manager should be enabling this team to be effective by building bridges to other functions where we have dependencies. And so that she calls that managing context. Are you managing the context surrounding your team? Are you building bridges? So I ask people, if you list your key initiatives that you're working on, and then you listed next to them where you have the people that you have dependencies on, and then you list next to them, what's your contact strategy with those people? Are you taking them to lunch? Are you taking them to coffee? When's the last time you interacted with them? You've got to be managing the context because obviously, you know, business is a team sport. So we have all these dependencies cross-functionally that we rely on. Solo Flyer doesn't understand that yet. So the third reason for derailment is version 1.0. And this one's sort of terrifying. This happens a lot mid-career. You get these, you get complacent in your job, you're good at your job, and you kind of dial down your curiosity. And you don't stay up to speed on cryptocurrency. And you aren't quite sure how AI might apply to your customer service business. You don't understand what Audible's doing to disrupt the subscription model, you know, to disrupt the publishing model. You just don't stay current and you become this fossilized dinosaur guy that's version 1.0. So he suffers from changing circumstances, lack of adaptability a lot of times to technological change, but sometimes it's another kind of change. He's not adaptable to getting a new boss. When I derailed, I was doing really well with my old boss, and he was a very empowering boss. When I got the new boss who was more participative, I had organ rejection. And I lost. <laughs> he didn't lose. I lost. So that's the first one. Then the other one is just making sure you stay curious. So I ask people that might suffer from this, how well are you honing your discovery skills? Are you, this is based on work from Clayton Christensen of Harvard. He looked at executives that have either delivery skills, he found they kind of neatly break out into delivery skills and discovery skills. Delivery skills are like analyzing, um, executing, communicating, aligning, and discovery skills are these five. So how well are, uh, he also found that people that are innovative have a ratio of six to one on questions asked to statements made. So they ask a lot of questions, a lot of what if and how might we questions. They also observe customers. They go out in the field, they go out in the market, and they watch customers interact with the product to understand what problems are they facing, what kind of workarounds are they doing, how can they improve the product. One time I spent some time, I, take, I teach this class that's all about this stuff called New Venture Discovery at Kellogg. You might know the shoe Allbirds. That came out of my class. That was a, a student in my class that invented this shoe in our class. We build prototypes, we go out in the market, we test these rough prototypes, digital prototypes, then we build you know, physical prototypes, kind of IDO-esque research. Tim Brown developed Allbirds, doing a lot of this observational research. One time I was with this guy who was the product manager on an adult diaper brand. And we were spending, doing some research with, with him. And I said, well, what's it like to, how long have you been on the business? He said, four years. I said, what's it like to wear the diapers? And he said, well, I'm not incontinent. And I said, I know, but like, if you t put on the diapers and you pee in them, what's it like when you walk around with that on? And he said, well, I've never done that. And I said, how do you understand what your customer is going through if you're not wearing the product? So, you know, being the discovery research is being out in the shoes of the customer and seeing what they experience. It's also experimenting. Uh, I know Google's very good at this, and Amazon's very good at this. Bezos once said, I haven't failed, I've just found a thousand things that don't work. You know, this is A-B testing, this is building rough prototypes and getting them out in the hands of customers and watching them interact with them, experimenting. 
Also, another aspect of discovery skills that version 1.0 could use is networking. Really establishing a strong set of relationships with people that have uh, diverse backgrounds that can help you problem solve. So really working on your networking skills is very important. And then the big kind of the Mac Daddy of them all is associational thinking. Your ability to synthesize diverse inputs. So this is, you know, the example people give is like uh, George Mistral walking his sheepdog in the Alps. And then he comes home and he picks the burrs out of the dog and he comes up with Velcro. Yeah, associational thinking. Uh, Einstein said creativity is nothing more than combinatorial play. So version 1.0 lacks this discovery orientation and it's hurting his effectiveness. The fourth reason I found that people derail is, is this archetype is the one trick pony. This is someone who's very competent at one thing, but they haven't broadened. So maybe it's a controller who would love to be the CFO, but she knows accounting. She's, she got us off QuickBooks in her startup. She's great with audits, but she doesn't understand, she doesn't have any exposure to forecasting or to capital asset management, to long range strategic planning, and she's not going to get the CFO job that she'd like because she hasn't broadened enough. So this is a derailer that hits us a lot of times mid-career too. We've gone narrowly up a path, which is smart because we've become an expert, but at some point we have to start broadening our skill set and our experience set if we want to be able to keep rising up through the organization. This person suffers from over-dependence on one skill. So they're sort of lopsided and they haven't broadened their skill set. They also may have a key skill deficiency in an area that's really important to the business. So for example, if you're at um, Electronic Arts, it's a local business. If you're at EA like I was, what do you, where, where, what do you have to know? Even no matter what department you're in, you have to know what? Something about what? You have to understand gameplay. You have to understand um, how a great game is made, how you can make a game addictive in 50 strokes, is what they say at EA. If you're at Frito-Lay, you have to understand sales and distribution because that company is built around 25,000 route salespeople putting the product everywhere. You've got to understand that. She has a, a, could have a key skill deficiency in an area that's important to business. And she doesn't have, she hasn't had enough experiences that give her the ability to see the big picture and solve complex problems by understanding the role different functions play in an organization. So let's say I had this one trick pony in my group and I'm at Walmart. And this is the feedback she's gotten and she's, I'm mentoring her. I might do something like this. Now this is my only wonky slide, so forgive me. It's my one business wonky slide. So let's look at this. I might say, Gail, let's say her name's Gail. Gail, let's lay out the critical path of Walmart. What's the critical path? The critical path are the key activities in any company that add value to the customer, okay? What are the key activities at Walmart? We would write down sourcing, merchandising, ops, and store operations. Then we would say, within those areas, what are the critical things we do that we got to be good at to win? And we would write down supplier negotiation, because you got to negotiate for EDLP, everyday low price, assortment planning, good, better, best for the assortment, right? Making sure you're in stock on the products, under logistics, inbound and outbound warehouse management, What's the inventory software that allows the product to flow in and out of these big warehouses? And inside the store, two critical areas are planograms, merchandising action alley, and managing the 700 people that are inside of a super center. So those might be six of the things we write down that are critical path activities at Walmart. And I say, Gail, do you understand these activities? No. You know, let's say I'm, she's a controller who wants to become the CFO. I'd say, well, how about we set up time, a day, a day with somebody who's an expert in each one of these places in the company. But they'd love to have you tag along and watch them for a day. So in the next two months, we're going to take six days in the next two months, 
for you to get exposure with a store manager on how they manage labor, understanding the planogram philosophy around how we merchandise inside of a store, get inside of a warehouse and understand inventory controls and management. I guarantee you, after she has those experiences, there's nobody that's gonna say she's, she's non-strategic because she's gonna understand the company and the critical path of activities that create value to the customer. So I would, I would ask you guys, you know, a rhetorical question, what are the critical path activities at Google? And do you understand them? Regardless of what function you're in, whether you're an engineer, you're in sales, sales and marketing, do you understand the key activities that Google does to create differentiation in the market? And if you don't, talk to people who have a nice purview, list those key activities down and just start familiarizing yourself with those areas that are outside of your function so you broaden your view on the business. This is a very, very solvable derailment area. Captain Fantastic is tougher, because that's a behavioral issue, right? That person is gonna probably have to have a two by four upside the head before he realizes that his ego run amok is not gonna serve him well. This one you can fix. So the last one, and then we'll take a little break and we'll talk about some of these. This is the whirling dervish. This person doesn't deliver on promises. Usually it's a very creatively minded person whose eyes are bigger than their stomach. They take on too much. They usually have poor organizational skills. They don't have a system. They should probably read David Allen's book, Getting Things Done. <laughs> they have trouble prioritizing what are the key activities that I should really focus on that move the needle, the high leverage activities, and which are the ones I can blow off because we can never get all of our stuff done. So they need to prioritize their A, Bs, and Cs and hit the A's hard probably ignore the C's. They probably don't understand process management. If you ask them to look at their projects and do a Gantt chart on them, they probably wouldn't be able to go cradle to grave what the key activities are and how long they take. So they might say to the boss, yeah, I can get that done by June. No, 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 F we're not gonna get FDA approval on the product till May. Then we gotta order packaging film. We gotta move the product through the supply chain. By the time it goes on shelf, it's gonna be December, not June. They don't understand the critical path. And often they're pleasers who can't say no. And this is one of my behavior, this is another one of my derailment areas, is I overextend by saying yes to too many things. So a, no, a good trick there is, first of all, I love the book, The Power of a Positive No. That's by a guy named William Urey, who wrote Getting to Yes the book on negotiations, he's a Harvard professor. He says in The Power of a Positive No, remember when you say no to something, you're saying yes to something else that's important to you. So I might be saying yes to my kids, dinner with my kids and my wife. I might be saying yes to a workout for my stiff neck. So that's one thing I always remember as a reformed pleaser. Another one is, Adam Grant talked about this in his book, Give and Take. He talks about the five minute favor. Maybe you say no, but you spiff them. You help somebody out so it's not a cold, harsh no. I'll give an example of this. I was just asked to go to Seattle to give a presentation to high potential Kellogg prospects. And I'm in the middle of this book tour and I'm teaching two classes and I'm a venture capitalist. I don't have time, I didn't have time. But I told the director of admissions, I can't go to, I can't fly out to Seattle from Chicago, but if you tell me the three or four or five people that you meet there that are entrepreneurial, I'll call them and I'll try to convince them to come to Kellogg. So instead of a two day commitment, I turned it into a three or four hour commitment. So that's like a five minute favor. So these are the five. Captain Fantastic, ego driven, doesn't listen, you know what St. Francis of Assisi said, seek to understand before being understood. Doesn't get that. Interpersonal issues. But remember, you might not be a Captain Fantastic and you might still have one of those derailment traits that Hogan has in those 11 descriptors. Doesn't build and lead teams. That's often earlier in a career, super good individual contributor that gets a team and still tries to do the work themselves. 
version 1.0, which is that a problem with adaptability and often a problem with learning. Stay, got it, I doubt that's gonna affect you guys because you're probably very curious. But staying curious and not getting set in your ways is, a, is a definitely a derail, a derail for most people. Being narrow, that one trick pony, going up in a, vertic in a vertical way instead of taking lateral moves to get more experience or raising your hand to be on a task force to gain your exposure into other areas. And then the whirling dervish, which has trouble delivering on promises because they overextend. So maybe we stop there. These are the five things I found in three years of research that cause talented people to derail. Great. So we're going to pause here for questions. I know uh, we'll take some questions, and I'll let you speak in the mic. Anyone have a question top of mind? Hi, thanks for being here. Of the five common uh, reasons for derailment, what's the distribution like? Which ones are more common than others in the research that you see? Very good. Two of them affect more people than the other three, and they are version 1.0. I think that with the rate of change that we live in, if you don't, if you know, you shut your eyes, you know, things change. It's staying curious, um, learning agility. Learning agility is, you know, are you open-minded? Are you reflective? After you do something, do you reflect on how it went? Do you seek feedback constantly, you know, on a regular basis? Do you have those discovery skills to go out in the market and watch your customer and, and, and talk to your suppliers? Look at the competition. So that is, the, that is the, probably the single biggest, along with interpersonal issues that are usually driven by lack of empathy and lack of understanding the other person's perspective. Now, here's a caveat. On my website, I built this website and I put my derailment assessment on it. So if you go on cartercast.com, I think it's backslash resources, you'll see this assessment you can take to see which of these five you might suffer from. The number one self-reported reason, everyone is saying they feel like a whirl, not everyone. There's a lot of people saying they feel like a whir whirling dervish. So my theory on that is, with so, we're being deluged with, you know, tweets and texts and emails and social media messages. I think everyone just feels like a whirling dervish right now, period. So that is the highest self-reported, but the research, and it was a really rigorous, it's those two I mentioned. Oh, hold on, let me, get, let me get you the mic. Thanks, I have a quick follow up on that, which is, how much of them are unique to a particular archetype versus a mix of a few? Because I see bits of myself in a few of them. Yes, that's a really good question. A lot of times, different stages of your career, you flirt with different ones of these. So I was told I was a one-trick pony when I didn't understand PepsiCo very well. And they said, you know, you're, you're not strategic. You're good at getting things done, but you don't really have a good sense of strategy. Well, I was 30. You know, I was going to learn that over time. So I, I, that, the Captain Fantastic is a tendency I have with, with bosses that micromanage me that's very bad that I learned about mid-career. I'm worried now about version 1.0 because of the rate of change in technology, and I worry about whirling dervish now because I'm overextended. So, I think it's natural to feel like there's bits and pieces of these. In the book, I actually have, I spend probably, this is more like a field guide. I lay out the derailleur, and then I spend a lot of time on remedies. So you'll find different pieces of derailers that affect you, and you'll find certain remedies that might help you. But I think it's natural to feel like you have pieces of different ones of them, especially if you look over time. You might have felt like earlier on you, you were a solo flyer, but then you became a good manager. And then another one will kind of bother you at a later time in your career. Uh, this might be jumping ahead a little bit, but I'm wondering if how many of the successful people that you talked to had derailed? Like, is that a common thing that people end up being successful also I'm derailed? I'm so glad you asked that. How many of these successful people derail? So here's what's interesting. We get all these speakers come into Kellogg, and I'm sure you get all these speakers, and they tell these up and to the right stories, you know? And it's just horseshit. Like, people run into career trouble all the time. 
And so my whole intent of writing this book, I mean, I'm a VC and a teacher. This, this is just a labor of love. Is I just feel like these conversations aren't being had enough inside of companies. The boss should be sitting down with a subordinate, and they should be working together on a development plan that pinpoints some of these areas and unlocks someone's potential by addressing them. It just doesn't. It just isn't happening enough. Talented people run into this stuff all the time. This is, this is nothing to be ashamed of having one of these. You know, it's like we're human. We're going to have some weaknesses and some vulnerabilities. The point is, and I'll point out this in the next section, people that do well are on top of their own shit. They see their own derailment areas. They see their own vulnerabilities. And they either work around them or they find someone who compliments them who can help them in the area that they're weak. So don't, you know, don't take away by any stretch of the imagination that people that are really talented don't go through this. Here's what happened. I talked to all the people, I, I talked to 100 people who got fired or derailed. 80% of them recovered. And those who recovered, not surprisingly, were the ones that accepted the feedback, that incorporated that this, I, this was on me to fix. So sad. Some of the people that I talked to that had gone on and derailed, multi, like one guy I talked to three times in a row for the same thing, he kept, he kept taking the feedback and blaming it on the organization was like this, my boss was like this, and I just was, my heart went out to him. But I was a researcher, so my job wasn't to play coach. It was to continue asking him questions to see what he was doing about this. And you know, I don't know if he's going to have an event, this one particular fellow, at some point, he was going to realize this is on me to fix versus you know, projecting it on somebody else. You want me to go into the next section? Yeah, let's and go to the we, next section. I think you're going to like this next section because it's the, pie, it's the happy stuff. Good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. OK, so this will be a shorter section. So flipping it on its head and saying, People that are considered to be superstars in their organization, what do they look like? Are there any specific behavioral traits or competencies they have that make them do so well? So I found out that there's a couple things. One is they are self-aware. B, they understand their motive structure. And then two, they have two specific competencies that matter a lot. Okay, So self-aware. What do I mean by that? They are closer to those who rate them in 360s. If they say on a scale of 1 to 5 they're a 4 in analytical thinking, the chances are that people rating them say they're a 4 too. They don't say they're a 4 and everybody else says they're a 2. They have an accurate self-conception. People with inaccurate self-conception, I looked at hundreds of thousands of 360s, people with inaccurate self-conceptions derailed six times more frequently than those who are accurate in their rating in 360s. Wow. That is based on Corn Ferry 360 research. Secondly, they put themselves in the right context because they understand their motives. So if I asked you, what's going on in this picture? What might you say? Anybody? What's going on in this picture? So let's say you say, well, Beth and Joe are working together in a lab, and they've worked together five years. They have a great working relationship. They really enjoy working with each other. You would show an affiliation motive. That's the lens you're looking at through. Let's say you looked at this picture and you said, yep, Joe's mansplaining yet again. There he goes. That's a power motive. You're interpreting it in terms of a power dynamic. Let's say you look at it and said they're this close to solving the, the Zika, to finding the formula for the Zika virus. That's the achievement motive. So this guy named David McClellan from Harvard said, motives are bare, because values are, values are easier. Values are what's important to you. So if I asked you, what do you value, you'd probably you'd be able to answer it, maybe give you a minute or two. But you could probably say, I value uh, intellectual um, learning. I value my family. Uh, but if I said, what, what drives you? What are your motives? It's like, ugh, that's subconscious. It's trickier. So to try to get at motives, McClellan did this picture story exercise, which the Hay Group has created into an assessment tool, 
where you have to interpret a bunch of stories, write down what you see, and then a psychologist marks it up and tells you what your motive profile looks like. So McClellan says, motives are critical because they drive us. So we want to be in a position that maps to our motive structure. And he said, there's an achievement drive we have to beat a standard. I bet a lot of you guys have a high achievement drive. There's an affiliation motive to be have close relationships and love teamwork. And then there's a power motive to wield influence and enjoy status. So then I asked the people from the Hay Group that worked with McClellan, do different positions have different motive structures? And she said, oh yeah. I said, what, is a, what does a corporate CEO look like? What do you guys think? What do they gonna look like on achievement? Pretty high? What about affiliation? <laughs> Power? There you go. What do you think? I said, does an entrepreneurial CEO look the same as a corporate CEO? You're shaking your head. What do you think an entrepreneurial CEO looks like on? Good job. Absolutely right. I said, what does a good PM look like? And she said, oh, they're the decathletes. PMs, they got to be good at a lot of stuff. They've got to be achievement to land the plane. They've got to be affiliation to get people that don't report to them to work well with them. They've got to be good on power because people that don't report to them, they got to cajole them into getting their jobs done too. They get paid a lot because they're really talented across all three of these motives. So I took the test. Here was little Carter. <laughs> Super high in achievement drive. Every picture I interpreted was they're accomplishing something. High in affiliation, so I used we a lot. We're doing this, they are doing this, and very, very low in power. And so the woman, that, that the psychologist that did my assessment said, what was it like to be a CEO of a multi-billion dollar company when you have such low power drive compared to typical CEOs? And you know what I said? I didn't like the job. I was in the wrong job. When I was president, I was back at, uh, in Brisbane, California, just down the road here, and working with the software developers and working with the market, we're developing the product and I loved it. Then I got promoted to be the CEO and my job was to work with analysts. It was to deal with class, ac class action lawsuits, legal issues. It, all of a sudden, my, to, to influence groups of people and I would have rather been back working on the product with a team. So people in the, with the right stuff, they put themselves in the right work context. They understand their motivators and, they under, and they're self-aware about their strengths and weaknesses and vulnerabilities, so they put themselves in jobs that give them energy. And I can tell you firsthand that what I do now as a venture capitalist and a teacher fits my motive structure a lot better than, see, I don't get paid as much, but it fits my motive, I'm much happier. So in the book, I list these motives, and I added two more after talking to Dan Pink and doing some more research. Dan Pink wrote Drive. He says, Carter, you gotta add autonomy, because, you know, wanting to have discretion over your work. And you gotta add purpose, right? Mission driven, some people are just very mission driven. They wanna work in clean tech, or they wanna work in education, or healthcare reform. So in the book, I take each of these five motives, and here I just gave you a sample of two, but I ask eight questions around each of these areas. So for example, I, I'm very driven by autonomy. I do my best work when I have freedom to run with my ideas. I would rather struggle with the answer than be told it, right? So if you think that you might question your motive structure, in the book, I have eight questions in each of these five areas to really think about that might help you understand what's, what drives you and is the position you're in appealing to your motive profile? Because people with the right stuff, they put themselves in the right positions to succeed because they naturally work where they have energy. Because I, I'm similar to you, it's like achievement is important to me, power yeah. isn't, but normally when you see a lot of these things, they're just, together as like, you know, getting to the top and being yeah. the best. So achievement is you want your work, you want to be scored on your work. You want to be able to see the results in your contribution. 
Power is you want to wield influence over others and you enjoy the status. So if I look at power up here, I enjoy run, running clubs. and I've never run a damn thing in my life until I was a CEO. But I mean, like in growing up, I was never uh, a leader like that. You know, it just wasn't something I did. I was always like swimming or, you know, in club, you know, clubs that were about sort of better self-betterment. So they're very different. They feel like one might lead to the other. Achievement might lead to power. But the motive itself is pure in that if you like achievement, it's really about you wanting to measure yourself against the standard and beat it. So here's the last big thought. I told you there are two competencies that matter a lot. Okay, look at this. So most organizations have, what, 10 competencies. Some have eight, some have 12, but the average is 10. If you're only good, if you're only rated in the top quartile in managerial effectiveness in build strong relationships, one competency, the chances are 12% you're in the 90th percentile of your company in managerial effectiveness. If you only have one and it's drive for results, if that's the only competency you have out of 10, and that's the one that you're in the top quartile, the chances are 14% you're in the 90th percentile in your company and managerial effectiveness. But look what happens when you have the two of them. Build strong relationships and drives for results, the chances are 72. You don't have to have any of the other eight on average. If you have those two, the chances are 72% that you're in the top, you're in the 90th percentile in managerial effectiveness. It makes sense, doesn't it? You build strong relationships, you build bridges with other departments, you seek to understand before being understood, you're empathetic, you understand the other department's objectives, and then they end up reciprocity, they end up wanting to help you, you build bridges, and you drive for completion. If you add to those two, being self-aware so you put yourselves in the right positions given your gifts, that's the right stuff, that's the formula right there. So capable people derail because they don't have a good understanding of their blind spots and skill gaps. And people with the right stuff seek constant feedback so they can improve. And they're more self-aware so they can manage around their, their vulnerabilities and put themselves in the right positions given their strengths. That's it. That's it. With that, we can talk. Yeah, so we'll open up to questions. Thank you. Thank you. All right, questions. Does that surprise you guys to see that, you know, you have all these competencies and that there's only a couple that really, really matter? It made me feel better. Like, wow, really focus on these two areas. Yeah. What do you think, having gone through this process and written this book, looking back at your previous career, you really wish you would have known in your, <laughs> in your 30s, in your 20s? God, that's a good question. So I would, can I write on a whiteboard? Yeah, go for it. I think you bring it over. There we go. So this is the back of the brontosaurus. Let's say you're at a company that's mature. This is, this is size of company and this is time. Okay, this is the growth stage. This is the scale stage. This is the startup phase. And this is the incubate stage. Okay, this is probably like where you're getting funding. You're starting the idea. So you need to have a certain skill set here, right? You've got to have that associational thinking. You've got to be um, out in the market and finding the need, finding the job to be done, creating the idea. You have to be optimistic. You have to be resilient as hell because everyone says no to you all the time. You have to be a good salesperson to get uh, people to work with you and to convince people to loan you money. Then you start up, and all of a sudden, you start needing to have some good selling skills, some good marketing skills. You've got to raise capital. 
scale, you got to get processes and procedures in place to be able to scale, and you have to understand organizational design. You have to figure out product iteration and product extension. Here, you have to understand partnerships, business development. You're going into international markets. What's the next version of the product? How do you keep it alive? And then, boom, you're talking about complex, you know, being effective in a complex organization, um, cost management, how to how to uh, re re uh, um, re uh, integrate or uh, reinvigorate a brand like I'm on the board of Kellogg Company, the cereal company. How do you reinvigorate that brand? So these stages. Here's what I wish I would have known. I played here 11 years at PepsiCo, 50 billion dollar company, and I was always butting butting up against my own derailment tendencies. Then I went here to Electronic Arts when it was 600 million. And now it's what? You know, it's market cap's like 30 billion. And I felt much more natural because it was chaotic and it appealed more to my sort of enjoyment of like that speed. Then I went down here with, with two guys and started Blue Nile before it got Series A funding. And I realized that I loved this state, the, right in here. So one thing I wish I would have known is I should have slid down that brontosaurus sooner and gotten into these environments that are more, for me, better fit my own personality profile, this was fun. This was really fun. This was torturous for me with my personality, just with my natural motive structure. So understanding not only the tech, not only the industry you want to play in, and not only the function you want to play in, but where in this, where in the, um, in the stage of the company do you want to play? Yeah. Well, I had a question about, uh, so knowing that you were the CEO of Walmart and that mature part and like thinking it wasn't for you, when did you know that and, and like what was your strategy Very there? Very specifically something happened. So I went to Walmart, so I went to Blue, we did Blue Nile, then I went to Walmart when it was here. There were 30 of us starting it. And it was crazy and we made a bunch of mistakes and it was chaotic and it was fun. And then we got up into here and I was the CEO. And then they wanted to move me to, be the, to, to get trained under someone to be the CEO for uh, Sam's Club. That was my next move. And I had a good review. And I drove home. I had a condo in Bentonville and lived out here. And I drove back and I realized I don't have any energy right now. What's going on? Why am I not thrilled with this big opportunity? And I realized that I didn't have, I didn't think of it in terms of motive structure like I just talked about today. It, something was not right for me. And it was because I would have been playing up in here again at Sam's Club. And I liked playing in here. So what I did naturally was I left the company and I went back to another early stage startup again. So, you know, there, and I'm not, I'm not saying anything about evaluative about being in a mature company. It wasn't right for me given my personality. That's what I'm saying. Not that this is, there's yeah. many wonderful jobs up here. It just wasn't for me. I think we have time for one more question. We got one more? Um, you talk a lot about just like personal skills and things like that, but then, then you talked about how your reactions were with different managers. So how important do you think having an effective and like strong manager is in kind of career growth and being able to you know, correct yourself as well? Yeah, I was, I think, I can tell you the guy's name was Stephen Quinn, the Canadian that said, I, I mean, I, I brought him to Walmart. Once I got to Walmart, he became the chief marketing officer of Walmart because he so, was such a wonderful manager, he saved my career. So I, it's so important, I can hardly express it. Let's say you have a bad one, though. Let's say you're under somebody who's ineffective or they're a captain fantastic and they don't give. It's really important. You know, people say, well, it's important to have a mentor. It's important to have, I don't think of it as one mentor. I think of it as you want to plug into smart people different places of your organization to learn from them, but also to have safe haven if you need it. I was out in a job out here. I, drove, I had to drive to Pleasanton every day before the BART came through. And I was under a boss that was ineffective. And I ended up finding safe haven for a, somebody who had been an informal mentor. I said, this isn't working out. And he goes, come join my group. 
So I think what you want to do is you want to have multiple people you can count on, not like one Obi-Wan Kenobi mentor, <laughs> but like a bunch of people in different departments that you can say, hey, can I buy a cup of coffee and can you help me reason through this problem I'm facing? And because the chances are pretty good you'll find safe haven with somebody when there's a, or, a reorg or something and you'll be able to take advantage of that, that relationship. And it's actually fulfilling for them too if a smart person like you would want me, you know, you'd seek me out for my advice. So I, do, I wouldn't hesitate. I, I think when people put this moniker of mentor, it sounds so heavy, like there's this obligation. I don't think of it that way. I think of having like five or six different counselors that you can just go to now and again. Great. So I think we're out of time. Thank okay. you so much. Thank Carter you, guys. It's fun. Thanks.